Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are proud to uh, welcome our uh, immediate past chairperson of the Interfaith Alliance's Many Beliefs Serving Together Committee, Reverend Janie Kurt Morris. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are proud to uh, welcome our uh, immediate past chairperson of the Interfaith Alliance's Many Beliefs Serving Together Committee, Reverend Janie Kurt Morris. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are Hello. proud to uh, welcome our uh, immediate past chairperson of the Interfaith Alliance's Many Beliefs Serving Together Committee, Reverend Janie Kurt Morris. Good evening, everyone. Welcome, everyone. As Rabbi Abby said, I'm, my name is Janie, Janie Kurt Morris, and I'm glad you've decided to join us this evening. Um, I'm, we are part of, as- well, Welcome, everyone. As, as you, Rabbi Abby said, I'm, my name is Janie, Janie Kurt Morris, and I'm glad you've decided to join us this evening. Um, I'm, we are part of, as- well, Welcome, everyone. As, as Rabbi Abby said, I'm, my name is Janie, Kurt Morris, and I'm glad you decided to join us this Hi there. So we're ready to begin, and I, I am currently serving on the board for the Interfaith Alliance. And as Rabbi referred uh, to, I, I there served for a while as on the, as chair and on the I am committee. Serving on the board for the Interfaith Alliance, and as Rabbi referred uh, to, I. I there served for a while as on as chair and on the committee serving on the board.
Well, I'm back again and hope that uh, you're sticking with us. We're ready now. And uh, I wanted to say just a short bit before I introduce our first speaker that um, after I got involved in interfaith uh, activities here in Oklahoma City, I was felt very privileged to do that and then began to be active in the committee that is sponsoring this event, Many Beliefs Serving Together. We, um, before pandemic, of course, were able to have hands-on activities that did work in our community. Um, we would stop at a halfway point and take time to talk to each other in small groups, to listen and to speak about some of the ways we practice our faith or our beliefs. And uh, you'll find out more uh, by going to the website and, and Facebook page that we'll be on. I wanna briefly just welcome our first speaker, Raven Crisp. Raven is a native Oklahoma City person and um, studied in, um, at, in Oklahoma universities and she'll introduce herself more and what she's doing. We're glad she could take time and be with us. Raven, welcome. Hey everybody. Um, like she said, my name is Raven Crisp. I am born and raised in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I graduated from Oklahoma State University after attending Dale City High School. Um, I graduated 2017 with my bachelor's in business management. I definitely, um, I'm trying to think, I guess what I was saying um, is my transition, I probably should have graduated with a degree in social work, given the fact that that is what I've chosen to dedicate my life to. So after I graduated um, from Oklahoma State University in 2017, I pursued a um, career in social work, um, worked for DHS and Child Protective Services. Um, following that, I went ahead and um, started my second career post-graduate uh, with the Veteran Affairs, working um, in the Severe Mental Health Trauma Clinic. Shortly after that, I decided to um, switch gears once again and change um, fields back to where my degree is in um, business management to focus on financial management at Tinker Air Force Base. Um, I started my nonprofit February 2018. I've been doing the work of Selfless Hands for about three years prior to starting at Oklahoma State University. Um, just some background before discussing Selfless Hands. Um, during my college career, I was pretty focused on student leadership. I was very involved on campus. Um, I was working, attending school, of course. That's the whole reason of college. Um, when I lost a very close friend of mine, um, her name is Alexis Dawkins. Dock um, when I lost my friend, um, I turned into a very, I would say like a dark place. I was pretty depressed. I didn't really know how to handle um, death as close. I've dealt with a lot of close death um, within family, friends, but not as close as that one hit. Um, it hit very close to home. And through that time, I was able to sit back and realize, you know, okay, the, the world doesn't stop and life doesn't stop because of this. So we have to keep going. Um, so I had to find ways to cope and through coping, I realized that um, serving was the way. Um, I grew up doing community service. I was very active in Jack and Jill, National Honor Society, um, things like that. My parents had me pretty involved in uh, community service and advocacy pretty young. So I just went back to what I knew, which was service as my way of coping. Um, coincidentally, during that time, Oklahoma State University was having this uh, certification program where you could get a uh, cord uh, for doing 400 hours of community service um, during your time of school. At that time, I was in my second year, graduated early. So I graduated within three years. So I had two years to do 400 hours of community service. So during that time of doing um, my few hours, I were doing, um, I started doing service hours at the Salvation Army, Goodwill, um, the regional food bank. I just started going to different places and no shots to the places that I volunteered at. 
Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to see things from a behind the scenes perspective. But um, I realized that a lot of the things we were doing, I felt like it wasn't um, deep enough. I feel like it was something that was missing. I need to be more hands-on with the things I, were doing, um, I was doing at that time. So I decided to create my own service opportunities. So I started um, partnering with Our Sisters Closet, which is a great resource um, for those who are dealing with domestic violence. I started doing clothing drives and um, started doing things with the homeless uh, every quarter. Um, I started doing things wherein uh, we would have disasters like the floods in Baton Rouge in 2016, Hurricane Harvey 2017. Um, I started doing disaster reliefs like that as well. So fast forwarding up until February 2018, I just uh, 2018. I'm sorry, I decided to step out on faith and start my own nonprofit um, by applying that same efforts that I was doing in Stillwater, Oklahoma City, into my own community on the northeast side of Oklahoma City. So that's what led to Selfless Hands Foundation. Uh, we are pretty much focused on family welfare advocacy. We are focused on homelessness, addressing food insecurity, providing those with resources, and um, just pretty much helping the community members um, improve, I would say improve their quality of life um, in whatever way we can assist in. So that is a bit about Selfless Hands and myself. Thank you, Jamie. Yes, thank you, Raven. And uh, you know, some of the things on your website show a lot of different people involved. That's one of the things you've uh, worked on, isn't it? To welcome people to do the projects for their own community. You're an activator, aren't you? Yes, yes. It's definitely um, took a lot of praying, a lot of praying. Um, had a, I always say, you know, I had to kiss a lot of frogs to get to that point um, because I do feel like this is something that I'm called to do. Um, and along with having people, you know, by your side, not everybody is meant to be in that same role as you, but to have people beside you that support you, that is truly passionate about serving the community, self-starting um, potential, you know, where it's like, I don't have to always be there. You yes. know, you can say, hey, Raven, I know you're out. I know you're busy. We got it. Um, so I really, really appreciate my team for that. Yes, I'm sure you do. You have quite a team, don't you? Yes. Of leaders. Yes. yes. And a wide variety of age groups that take part in the projects you do. Yes, ma'am. Yes. 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 Want to add anything else you think of about Selfless Hands for now? We'll come back to you later in our event. Awesome. Thank you, Jamie. Okay, well, thanks. Um, since, uh, as you can tell, since the pandemic, our Many Beliefs Serving Together group has had to figure out ways that we can serve the community without being together physically, and we hope to be doing physical events soon. But I want, with our next speaker, to uh, mention that each year that I've been active, I've lived in Oklahoma City almost six years, and uh, each year, Many Beliefs Serving Together has gone to, the interfaith folks have gone to the regional food bank to work, to uh, process food in the work that Bailey Perkins is involved in now. So Bailey, welcome, and uh, tonight for you, and Bailey also is an Oklahoma native, grew up in Lawton, and went to college for her bachelor's and master's in Oklahoma colleges and has been left to be in Arkansas for a while, but came back and, and went to Washington, D.C. to work uh, there in the House of Representatives for a while and is back. And now we welcome you to introduce yourself some more, Bailey, and to um, tell us about your work with the food banks. Let me unmute myself. Uh, good evening, everyone. And Janie, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to speak before the Interfaith Alliance and for moderating this evening. Um, I am grateful for the work of 
this organization to bring people across religious backgrounds and faiths together uh, to work on common solutions that, that help our communities. And so I'm grateful for the work that you do. Um, I appreciate the things that you shared uh, related to my background. Um, I'm an OCU grad um, and went to the University of Oklahoma uh, to get my master's of public administration. And my concentration was in public policy. And so I've dedicated uh, the past seven, eight years of my career so far uh, to working on policy issues that help people in this country. So from my time in Arkansas, the time of coming back here in Oklahoma, um, helping communities thrive. What are those root causes that lead people to be hungry or struggle to make ends meet or not have a roof over their heads? Um, what are those things that um, keep Oklahoma from progress, right? And so those are the areas that um, I center my work with both the Regional Food Bank of Oklahoma and Community Food Bank of Eastern Oklahoma as their state advocacy and public policy director. Um, both uh, food banks, between the, the two of them, they cover all 77 counties um, in Oklahoma through um, our partner network of pantries um, and, and agencies around the state that help us reach Oklahomans um, in need of food assistance. And so I began working with our food banks almost a year and a half ago. And we're looking at what are those things that will help us feed the line, meaning what are those, um, what are the things that we need on a day-to-day -day basis to be able to help get immediate food assistance to Oklahomans in need? So whether it's a natural disaster or a pandemic or um, the snowstorm that happened this year uh, that impacted families for two weeks uh, where people lost their electricity, meaning that there were families who lost the food that may have been in their fridge, right? Um, how can we be there to support people in those emergency times of need? And so we're thinking through ways that we can partner with um, communities. So we get a lot of support from uh, the general public, from the volunteers that typically come in our volunteer center pre-pandemic um, to uh, corporations and um, foundations who provide um, support in, in feeding our neighbors to so also federal programs. There are, there are programs that help us feed kids, seniors, um, and families in the state from SNAP to uh, the Summer Food Service Program um, and a range of other programs that, that help us um, get resources from USDA um, and fresh nutritious foods from farmers to get to families. And so we're honored to be able to, to do this work, to be able to um, help families in, in those critical times of need, um, but also talk about the, the shortening the line side of the work. So I talked about how we get food to people, but we're also committed to doing what it takes to ensure that we can get to the root causes of, of uh, what leads to families struggling. And so that's the area that I would love to talk more about this evening is ways that people can engage and be an advocate to help us um, talk with elected officials um, and other advocates to help ensure that Oklahomans um, have the supports that they need uh, to get on their feet, so. Thanks, Bailey. And I wanna ask you if you could, uh, thanks for the description. I know that you work the big picture, but still you hear stories, don't you, about families, individuals. Without naming names, maybe you could give us a a more individual example of both, if you can, both of just receiving help on the, you know, right then, and yeah. also that shortening the line to helping people move from uh, needing public assistance or assistance from the food bank to uh, being more able in their own abilities to uh, 
provide for themselves. I'll give a great example of the connection between uh, the work that happens in government with our ability to help provide assistance. Uh, yeah. This year, with the pandemic, there was a rise of Oklahomans who lost their jobs, um, may have been furloughed, hours cut back, um, or they may have had to close shop on their businesses. So there are a lot of people who never needed food assistance before uh, needing it in this season. And so on average, our food bank saw about a 30% increase in need nice. Nice. on the already um, tough challenges of food insecurity in our state. Um, yes. Oklahoma is the sixth hungriest state in the nation. That was, I was going to ask you that. Yeah, yeah. Six like one in six um, people, but one in nearly one in four children um, go hungry, right? And so with the pandemic, it just exacerbated um, those statistics, right? Yes. And so um, this year, um, we saw some challenges with people and their ability to get their unemployment. We saw the lines of, of people literally waiting 24 hours outside yes. to get in front of someone to talk about how to get their unemployment benefits, to make sure that their families can be fed, to keep a roof over their heads, um, and to, to maintain uh, their quality of life, right? And um, we saw what was happening on, on TV, and um, we know that uh, the OESC was going to host a, um, a, a big distribution at, uh, not distribution, I'm sorry, but they held a big um, um, event for people who were needing unemployment assistance to come to the Reed Center um, in Midwest City. And so our executives were like, we want to do something, right? We, we got to help somehow because this is, yes. you know, if more than, you know, thousands of people are waiting in line to, to get in touch with someone. How can we help? Yes, and so indeed. we reached out to the agency and partnered with them um, to host a distribution a block away from the Reed Center with uh, UCO. So we had a great partnership um, with the institution that allowed us to, to set up. Yes. And just within a couple of hours, we served um, 779 families um, and more than 2,200 individuals, right? And yeah. so that just shows, you know, the impact. And, and people were so grateful to be able to have that chance to, to get food because um, it's, it's really hard, you know, for a lot of folks in this season um, to be able to have their basic needs met. And yeah. so during that part of the pandemic, we were able to um, help get food in the hands of families who, who were needing that food assistance. Mm -hmm. um, we hear stories all the time of seniors who have to choose between buying their prescription medication yes. or buying something nutritious to eat, right? Or being able to pay a bill because they have a fixed income, right? Yes. Those are common stories that many um, Oklahoma seniors face, right? Um, yeah. There are kids who um, go home and, and don't have a meal to eat. And that was one of the drivers of the creation of the backpack program that uh, both food banks have. And we're able to serve thousands of kids across the state um, by getting them kid-friendly, um, nutritious, foods that they could eat over the weekends to make sure that, that they are able to come back to school because we know that kids rely on the breakfast and lunch that they get at school um, to be able to, to sustain during that weekend. And so that's a couple of examples of, of yeah. the impact that we're able to, to have and, and how we partner with organizations. Great, thank you very much. And we purposefully, the Many Beliefs Serving Together Committee paired you serving this in a big, a wide view of Oklahoma with uh, Raven and Selfless Hands, which is really a, roots, a grassroots organization that's working in a particular area of Oklahoma City primarily, right, Raven? 
And uh, so maybe you could give us an example or two without naming names of, of groups or individuals and the difference that selfless hands made by projects that you have done. Okay, um, so I will start with one, we frequently, um, actually, okay, sorry. We just had our first giveaway. It was official giveaway where um, we were able to provide meals, clothes, um, hygiene products, toiletry items, shoes, all of those things that were in good condition, but we regularly do that. Um, we adopted between 23rd and 36th Street of Prospect um, Avenue on the Northeast side. And by doing that, we not only clean the streets on that side, but we also go home to home to make sure everybody's good. Yeah. Um, if there's anybody who may be disabled, may not be able to mow their lawn, um, we try to connect those with um, lawn care companies who don't mind donating those services. Um, so we do a lot of hands-on things like that. Um, people are able to just call us and say, hey, like, I don't have any clothes. And rather than giving them, you know, one or two outfits, we give them as much as we have just because, um, as we know, kids can go through clothes like no other. And even as adults, depending on what we're doing, we change clothes like swimwear or underwear. Um, so one or two outfits aren't gonna do, especially if um, a family is living in a home without electricity or water, can't wash their clothes frequently. Yes. Um, and then another example I would give would be our trunk or treat event that we do. Um, every year, trunk or treat for Halloween, um, we have it at Ice Event Center. And that provides families and individuals with the opportunity to still um, experience Halloween despite their circumstances. Um, a lot of families don't have transportation. A lot of families have financial burdens um, and can't necessarily give their children the Halloween experience that their other peers may be able to give their um, families. So we try to bring that straight to the neighborhood so that um, people can come and have a good time. So. Yes, sounds great. And I did see some of that on your website too, that people can go to and see. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if each of you might uh, like to also name, uh, and you have of course some, but to articulate again or, or in a different way, a one or two hopes you have for this, the rest of this year, the rest of 2021 for the communities you're aiming to serve and the mission of your organization. Um, I would say my two hopes would be uh, one to kick off our campaign so that we can um, open up our brick and mortar um, donation center so that, you know, we'll be able to be more available and store more things to help people um, have more really opportunities to come get what they need. Um, and the second hope that I would have would be to um, encourage community members to come out and get what they need and donate what they can. Um, com promoting unity within the community is very big to me. So that's what I'm hoping that we all can just rely on that phrase and takes a village and actually live by it, so. Yes, yes. How about you, Bailey? A hope or two. Um, one of my biggest hopes for this year is to maintain the drumbeat for the eyes of the public that even though we're making progress in terms of the, the COVID-19 pandemic itself, there's still a lot of families and our neighbors who are in need and our state is still and it's a recovery process and that takes time. Yes. Uh, I attended a national conference with Feeding America, an organization called the Food Research and Action Center known as FRAC. And the president of Feeding America and our, our CEO uh, made the statement that hunger was on the forefront of the eyes of many in the public because we saw the lines of cars outside, right? Mm -hmm. um, due to the way that we had to change our distribution methods to help get emergency food assistance to families. But eventually 
people will go back inside and it, hunger won't be as visible as it was during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so in the ways that we cared about wanting to help our, our friends and families in need of seeing the magnitude externally and, and out front, we have to maintain that same lens um, whenever we recover from the pandemic because Oklahoma um, was already one of the hungriest states um, and the pandemic has worsened our progress um, towards food security. And so we have to continue um, working towards Oklahoma being a place where uh, people have livable wages, right? Continuing to strengthen our safety net making sure that our state budget, that we're investing in agencies that help people get on their feet, right? And so we're currently having those conversations and we're involved in coalitions that are working to say that in a season where um, lawmakers are considering tax cuts, we're asking lawmakers to consider investing so that more Oklahomans can get ahead and our economy can improve faster because otherwise we're going to set ourselves back. So um, I would say that would be my hope is that we continue the attention that we've placed on hunger and continue working towards getting to food security. Um, one of the best examples uh, recently that's great policy at the federal level is the extension of child nutrition waivers. Um, they were extended a couple of days ago through 2022. Originally, they were just extended um, through the end of the summer, basically, or like through September. Um, but now they're going to be extended through 2022. And what that means is that we'll be able to more easily and safely serve children. So there were, for example, in some certain policies that said that kids had to physically be in this congregate setting, sitting down, eating their apple in order to get their food. And if they had to leave, they had to leave that food sitting there, right? And with the waivers, the waivers allow for children to grab and go to get food. Or during the pandemic, one of the tough pieces was um, being able to, um, make sure that families can take meals with them for their children um, because there was a, um, a requirement that said that foods can only be served during certain hours to make sure that there's no waste or um, foods not going where it's not supposed to and other things. Um, but by adding that waiver, we were able to help moms and dads um, get the meals for their kids you know, at the beginning of the day, so they didn't have to keep coming back to get food for their families. And because some of the, that red tape was lifted, we fed more people. We had a higher participation rate than normal, right? And so by extending those child nutrition waivers, that's going to continue helping us feed more kiddos. And so things like that really help us in and keeping kids fed and making sure that people don't go hungry in the season. And so um, I, I just hope that we continue pushing lawmakers um, and continue talking about the needs on, on hunger in our state. Yes, yes. And I hear both of you being encouragers. Yes, yes encouragers of the people you're serving, but also of the folks that are on this Facebook uh, live event uh, you might think just for a moment, and I'm going to stop just to say, those of you who are with us on Facebook Live, you do have an opportunity to type in under comments any of your comments toward, uh, for Raven or for um, uh, Bailey. Also, you can type in any questions that have come to your mind, and we can field those in a moment, okay? Uh, any, put those up now and we'll be uh, checking that to see if some of those come in. Um, I'd like to take that topic of first of encouragement. Mm -hmm. And both of you have, have referenced um, 
you know, your, how you've come to this, to this work you're doing. Um, think back to any particular time, person, class, and you've named some of those I know already, but let's swing back to that because part of what we can be, all of us to one another, our encouragers, what were some encouragements you had that helped you get this focus to be able to serve? Um, I would say the biggest encouragement that I had was just do it, literally like cliche just do it of course there was some more choice words at that time sure. but it was screw what anybody has to say screw who doesn't support screw who's not with you you know and focus on what your calling is what you're supposed to do what you're you know where your heart is and spend that time with those who are like-minded um, and that was very encouraging for me because at that time I was battling people pleasing. I was battling, you know, loneliness in the journey. Um, and a lot of times when you're transitioning from um, one aspect to your life to the next level, you can't bring everybody with you. So during that time, you know, I'm 21 years old, fresh out of college um, or about to be out of college. And I'm wondering why in the world don't anybody really care about serving you know we're all we're in these you know sorority fraternity these student leadership groups in every um at least one principle of each of those things is serve or community service why am i by myself you mm. know so it's like during that time while you're battling people pleasing um you're not understanding why people aren't seeing um your passion seriously um because this affects all of us that was the best encouragement I could have had at that time um, to get me Thank through. You. Good. Thank you. How about you, Bailey? Anything from you on this? Yeah. So I would say there are few areas of life that led me to this journey in being a lobbyist and an advocate on behalf of all of us, right? Um, I'd say my, my background um, and what I saw as a child. Um, my mother raised us um, in Lawton. Uh, she was a church secretary. And in the summers, my mom couldn't afford to pay for childcare with us. And so we just spent time with her at the church um, during the summer months. And my church had a feeding ministry that each day a different church or community organization sponsored the meal and prepared it in our kitchen for those who needed it in the community. And while I was up there, my mom would let me volunteer with whatever organization or church was there that day. And I got to see what hunger looked like around me, right? It was everyday people. There were kids my age in the serving line. Yes. And learning that that was probably the only meal that they may have eaten that day, right? Um, so I would say that experience growing up um, led me to caring about that foundational issue of, of hunger because yes. if people don't have food in their bellies and they're not having um, nutritious meals to eat on a regular basis, it impacts everything. Um, the issue's intersectional. So I think that's the other piece of what I've learned over time through um, education, but also my work even previously with the Oklahoma Policy Institute. Um, yeah. Learning that um, people and their issues don't live in a vacuum, right? Um, if someone is hungry, then that likely means that they don't have access to health insurance to be able to go to the doctor when mm -hmm. they need to, or to be able to pay that copay, right? Whenever they have to get a prescription, right? Mm -hmm. Um, if someone is hungry, that means 
they may or may not have a place to call home, right? Or they may be um, in a place that may not be safe, right? Um, and so thinking about the intersectionality of the issues and then who is disproportionately affected by it, right? Yes. You see a lot of folks um, who are behind economically because of systems that have been created and things and, and th things over time. And so those areas fuel my passion for um, the issue of dismantling poverty, um, uplifting communities, building equity, um, and hunger is at the intersection of all of those issues. And so I think those are the things that, that fuel me is that personal experience of what I, yes. what I saw as a child, but also what I've learned about where we need to, um, like how, how you build communities and how you help people thrive, right? So. Yes, well, yes, that's from, I hear the same, our similarities for both of you and they are both passion. You, you speak with passion about what you're doing, but also I would say not only are you encouraging the the folks on Facebook Live are sending a lot of love and gratitude your way, by the way, in the comment sections. But also um, there's that move to compassion. It's not, not, and well, that's the name of your organization is Selfless Hands. It's not just for yourself, but rather it's that compassion that reaches out to people where they are at the time. I mean, the heart of policy is people, because at the end of the day, the decisions that are made, uh, whether it's 23rd and Lincoln, whether it's Washington, D.C., or our city councils and, yes. and other forms of government, at the end of the day, they make decisions that impact all of us. Right. And there are people who have the capacity and the ability and the affluency to be able to be literate in the systems and to be present. And then there are others who are focus on how do I just get by and survive today? Right. And so it's up to us to be able to show up for people to be able to change that so we can have equitable and, and safe communities that thrive. Because at the end of the day, I mentioned it's, it's about people. Yes, yes, indeed. I think that compassion on my end, me not being, um, necessarily in policy, um, but more on the ground. Um, I would say the biggest thing is getting community members to a place where it's like, okay, it's okay. Like it's literally, it's okay. It's okay that right now you're not where you want to be. It's okay that right now you're lacking these resources. It's okay right now that you're needing clothes. It's no judgment. You're not the only one. But the first thing that we can do as a community is to try to uplift you and try to change that situation. And right now, that first step is getting you some clothes. That first step is trying to find you uh, employment. You know, that first step is trying to get you health care. You know, things like that. So I think that's where I try to encourage those to really just think outside themselves and realize that we all could be in that same position. Mm -hmm. It just... Right now, the cars weren't dealt that way. But who's to say that you can't be in that position? So that compassion, that empathy, and even a bit of sympathy has to come into play so that we can get over that hump. Because a lot of people, you know, say, oh, well, folks are too prideful. It's not necessarily pride always. It's one of those things where some people just don't know. Mm -hmm. So it's having that compassion enough to uplift and be willing to say, hey, I got you. But you have to have yourself too, because I can't do it all for you, but we got to work together. Meet me halfway. Yes. And I love what Raven said, because we often shame people and in, in being poor or lacking something comes with a scarlet letter. And that's something that we have to, to shift our mentalities on um, who is deserving, right? And so I value um, that lens of, of how you support people and how you show up for them and not having that, that judgment lens. Right. Yes. Yes. And, and in your work, you're showing up every day. Absolutely. And, and, and that's the great thing about the intersections of what 
Raven is doing and what I'm doing, um, data tells us that majority of Americans today are one paycheck away from poverty. Yeah. They're one illness away from being indebted for the rest of their lives. They're one car breakdown from losing everything, right? They're one um, missed rent payment <laughs> away from being in struggle. And so all we all have proximity um, to being in that place. And so while Raven is focused on helping meet people's immediate needs, we can also at the same time look at how do we change structures and provide support to ensure that fewer people have to be in that situation of, I had to steal a cheeseburger to eat something that day, and now I have a criminal record and I'm struggling to get a job, and now I have these fines and fees to pay, and so things are just racking up in my life, right? And so there's just so many Americans that find themselves in these um, in these traps, right? Um, that continues because it's 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 expensive to be poor because everything is more expensive yeah. when you're when you're poor. And so um, I value the work that Raven's doing to help. Um, people, um, how would I describe that? In that immediate time of need to be able to have those basic resources to get by. Yes. And then- I always kind of- oh, Go ahead. I was gonna say, it's, it's all, I've, I've always struggled to find the best way to say it because I hate to say to get by, but in that immediate need, that's what it is, mm -hmm. you know? Um, we're, we're trying you to can't get forward if you can't get by exactly i mean i literally if you're sitting down i gotta help you get up yeah. we can't walk if you're sitting down so that's, that's exactly. kind of where we come in you know of course until we get more funding and more opportunities like that my main you know focus is how can we get you up and how can we sit down and say okay where do you want to go because right now you're in poverty that does not define you it doesn't define you, you know, and, and at the end of the day, a lot of people um, who have endured that struggle, sometimes I hate now in society, we wear it as a badge of honor. And then sometimes people are held pretty much in shackles by it, you know, that mindset is still there. And, and where I'm here is to uplift those, that where you start right here and where you're at is not how you have to finish. So let me help you one step at a time and then we connect other resources to get there. What would be uh, to our, I've got a question on the uh, Facebook page I wanna come to, but first I wanna ask you, uh, uh, this, this comment says, uh, well, let me go to it first and then I'll come to mind. You both were effective lobbyists in different arenas. Mm -hmm. How can you and we get more people to be effective advocates and to bring pressures and information to legislators and to elect ele legislators who will respond to our advocacy. So this is what I do. This is what I teach people. Uh, this is what gets me excited on a day-to-day -day, um, because people believe that they don't know enough to be able to use their voice. Uh, they feel that things feel too complicated to use their voice. But the reality is, is that decision makers are constantly hearing different pieces of legislation and they rarely hear from constituents. On average, we say about seven touches will get a lawmaker's attention on an issue. So that will be a phone call, a... An email, email. Um, a message, because sometimes we give them a reason to, to make whatever decision and it's, they didn't hear from anybody on a certain issue. Now it's not always the case, right? <laughs> but I truly believe that there is power in the people and people using their voice. 
the only thing that you need is your your lived experience, your personal experiences. That's what makes you an expert to speak to your elected leader about what's going on in your life and what the needs are. Yes. Um, and so I hope that people will build the confidence to be able to go to 23rd and Lincoln. That building is open to any and everybody. You can go there and watch what your lawmaker's doing. You can go to the fourth floor of the Capitol and write on a little sheet your name, who your lawmaker is, and say that your constituent, that's the buzzword, go see your representative or senator, say your constituent, they'll come right out for the most part to meet with you. If they don't do that, then you need a new representative and it's time for somebody, and it could be you, so to run, right? Um, the folks at 23rd and Lincoln are no different than any other person. And so you have what it takes to be able to, to be involved in this process. And so the first piece is getting that confidence. And the second piece is finding those sources that you trust, right? Um, I get paid to talk to people about what they need to know about food security and hunger in the state, right? Talking about our safety net, talking about issues of poverty. If that's something that you want to talk about, send me an email and say, hey, Bailey, I want to reach out to Senator such and such or Representative such and such, and I don't know what to say. Can you help me out? Yes. I'm happy to walk you through how to have a conversation with your lawmaker. Because at first it seems really scary until you actually do it. And then you feel empowered once you build that relationship, right? And so uh, following news sources, I follow Nondoc. I follow the Black Wall Street Times. I follow um, the Frontier. I follow KGOU. Um, and so following those news sources, and following the hashtag on Twitter, sometimes Facebook, OKLEG, keeps you informed about anything going on at the state capitol and conversations that people are having, right? Mm -hmm. And so there are ways to be engaged. You don't have to be the expert because the folks at 23rd Lincoln aren't experts on everything. They can't be, right? They right. rely on people they know and trust to give them information. And so become that constituent, become that person who emails their lawmaker and, and calls them and says, hey, I saw how you voted on this to let them know that you're watching them because you really do have power. And there are people like me who will be willing to help you along in the journey. Yes, yeah, so that leads me right into, and you've answered my last question was about how people can um, get in touch with you and do you want them to get in touch? So you've said yes, for sure. and. That would be to go on the website uh, to find you. Yes. Yeah, so um, my email is B as in boy Perkins, P E R K I N S, at R S B O dot O R G. I'm always on Twitter talking a whole bunch. And so you could follow me at Bailey, B A I L E Y, M as in mouse. Perkins, P-E-R-K-I-N-S, um, and I'm happy to, to help share information there too. Um, and I know that Raven could use the hands of the folks who are tuning in with us today to support the work that she's doing as well. Um, I will say from a regional food bank, a community food bank standpoint, um, they're beginning to open up their uh, volunteer center soon. So getting on um, our email list, will be great to know of opportunities that are going on. So rfbo.org for regional food bank, or if you live in the Tulsa area, okfoodbank.org. And then lastly, I share a bi-weekly advocacy newsletter. And so if you go to rfbo.org slash advocate, you can sign up for those newsletters and stay in the know on what's going on related to food security and what you can do that week to be an advocate. That's great. And let me insert here before um, I let Raven uh, answer that same question and we finish our, our time together, uh, that um, many beliefs serving together, as I said, that committee has planned and worked at the food bank each year. And I'm glad to hear it's reopening to 
be able to have us in inside to sort food. It'll, it'll be in the next few months once the pandemic, yeah. but we're going to slowly but surely start to, because um, we miss our volunteers. Because in fact, sure. I think it was either this week or last week was our volunteer week where we were celebrating our volunteers. And so we can't wait to get people back in, but right. to know when we start that process, people have to stay in the loop and follow us, so. <laughs> yeah, how about, you? how about you, Raven? Um, those who are watching, um, how do they get in touch with you? And any ideas on, uh, you know, ways of supporting, linking up with you? Um, well, first, Bailey, they're asking you to repeat the link for advocacy. And so this will be recorded. This will be recorded okay. also. Okay, perfect. Yes. Yeah, but yes. go ahead and give that. Sure. R F B O dot O R G slash advocate. And that will take you straight to our advocacy page where you can um, sign up for our advocacy alerts and, and read other information. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Raven. I just typed that in for you as well, Bailey. Thank you. Appreciate you. Yes. Thank you. Of course, girl, I got you. Um, so yes, you can contact me um, at contact at selfless hands. F is in well, foundation for short, FDN.org. Um, 405-652-9181, call or text. Um, you can reach us by our website, social media, all social media platforms. Um, you could support our organization in many ways. We're accepting donations. We're accepting um, volunteers with multiple initiatives that we have. Um, if you like fundraising, join us for our fundraising campaign as we try to um, kick off this donation center fundraising effort. Um, it's a lot of ways you can come get your hands dirty with us. Um, once we start getting into you know, elections and things like that, I am planning to get notaries involved and voters registrations and even um, just some simple events, um, educational where people can come get the um, policy or law that we're planning on voting on, or even the candidates um, broken down to where we all can understand it. Um, yeah. Cause a lot of people are scared to um, vote. They're scared to get involved in advocating because they feel like, like you said, Bailey, they don't know enough. Um, when in actuality, if we're going to be real, even as adults, we get to a point where we don't know a lot. We get into these jobs and we're like, oh yeah, like we got this and we pretend like we know, but a lot of us don't know either. So we're all learning and that's what we're here for to, you know, work together. Thank you very much. And I, uh, everybody that's on with us uh, in your own way, you can give a cheer for these two fine leaders and the work they're doing to to do good and for our community and to welcome other people to participate in the life we share together. So thank you for the time, the energy, your passion and care for our, our community and broader community. As I said, this um, has been recorded and will be up soon on our Facebook page if you want to go back and look. And I'm sure we can, we will, put up those contact, that contact information on our website for you. Um, so we hope that you, if you are not yet connected with the Interfaith Alliance, that you'll be encouraged to look at our website, maybe join our email distribution list. Uh, we have Facebook, obviously, and Instagram, ways to find out about the work we continue to do. So for tonight, Bailey, good night, and Raven, good night and thanks, and thanks everybody for being here. Bye.